So I just spent like five minutes recording the intro and there was no memory card in this. Good job, Ben. Anyway, you join me today to look at five things that I would not live without when it comes to filming a car. Now the first one is my beloved Sony a7R2, which is a phenomenal camera. In fact, it's one of the sharpest that money can buy. I've had it more than three years, and over that time I've taken probably tens of thousands of photos and filmed at least 50 car reviews. So it has been very, very good. It's compact, which makes a huge difference. It fits in the car. I usually mount it upside down because that gives you more allows you to have the camera a bit higher up, more at head level, particularly on slightly sporty, more exotic cars where the windscreen is sloped. So that works really, really well. And of course, the less weight you have hanging off a mount, the less the camera's gonna move. So you could have, I don't know, a Canon 1D or something gigantic, or something from RED, or something even fancier that films higher resolutions. But the problem is, you're gonna have to have a more serious mount and it's more likely and more susceptible to move around as you drive along. Because remember cars, it's the suspension and the roads that governs how smooth the footage is to quite a large extent. So the a7R2 is very good for that. It has five axis image stabilization. I like the fact that it can do 4K at up to 30 frames. This is good. I do wish it could do 60 or 120, but unfortunately this camera is a bit older. Newer ones can do this. Still waiting actually for the A7S 3 Come on Sony, sort your, sort your out. We all want that camera. Just having that extra frame rate would allow me to do a little bit more slow-mo. On this, it's 720p if you want really slow and it's jarring. Next to 1080, you can maybe jazz it up a bit, but next to 4K, it just looks, ugh, no, it is bad. It's horrible, not worth doing. Newer models do have better autofocus and that kind of stuff, but to be fair, this one takes incredibly sharp photos. It's 42 something megapixels. And the 4K res is very good. It allows you enough flexibility to crop in if you, for some reason, just wanna mix your frame up. You know, a lot of YouTubers jump in and out of a shot just to keep your interest peaked, basically. It can be a bit annoying, but just, if you do it subtly, it does help hold attention, slightly different viewpoint, that kind of stuff. And with 4K, not a problem at all. Well, this camera was supposedly uh, prone to overheating, but it's something that I've never really experienced. It's always been fine for me. I find if you have the LCD just off the back, uh, open a bit in other words, it will not overheat at all. But to be fair, I typically shoot in five to 10 minute intervals and that way it doesn't build up. I imagine if you just did a documentary in like Morocco for 40 minutes, it's probably gonna seize up. Never really been a problem. And also UK weather. If someone's using this camera in Dubai, then yes, that might not be so good. And of course, this thing only has the smaller batteries. The newer ones are about 30% or so larger capacity. However, I have three, and that is normally enough for a day of shooting. That's pretty good, unless it gets very cold. But I also have an in-car USB charger, so I can charge two batteries at once. So whenever I'm using the other ones, they're charging on a rotation. It just buys you a little bit more time, uh, because ultimately you don't want to fail an entire day's worth of shooting because you can't charge your camera. That is just annoying. To be fair though, you could buy a power bank and use that because this camera supports that feature, which is very useful. Or you can mains it out too. To be fair, the biggest negative for me is the fact that it just cost me 574 pounds and uh, that's quite a lot of money to fix the fact that it may have got some water in it. Very, very heavy rain in Croatia on a short press trip and it died. Once a little bit of water gets in, it starts to corrode, 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 and then suddenly you need a whole new PCB, whatever, can't remember, and seals and something else. So yeah, that was, that was painful. So to be honest, I probably would get something a bit newer, maybe the A7 III for similar money, because this one, it was new, it was two and a half thousand pounds. And I have no regrets buying it, but I think this has dropped quite a lot in price, but it's kind of, worth looking at some of the equivalent money to get a new camera that would be the same price as this used and then get a good lens. I think that's definitely a good way of doing it. Wow, I've been talking a long time about the camera itself. Let's move on to the second thing. Now number two is the lens. There are many lenses I wish I had, but this is a lens that I am so glad I have. 
I didn't really realize how good it was. I read some kind of good reviews, and then Mr. Philip Bloom, any of you guys into photography will probably know that name, he endorsed this lens as well. So I was like, wow, actually, maybe I wasn't insane. It is good. And it's the Sony FE F2 28 millimeter. So it's quite wide, but not crazy wide, but equally not quite there with 35 for portraits. So it's slightly awkward. However, when you're filming like I am now, in super 35 millimeter mode it's approaching a 50 mil which isn't bad for this kind of shot you get a bit of depth of field and separation good detail and it looks nice i think the main thing is that it's a very small lens and it's wide enough to film the interior of a car even a caterham the 7160 which if you've seen is squeezed it's actually classed as a japanese kai car so it is wide enough to do that job. It's light enough that it doesn't put too much strain on the mount, something I was talking about earlier. It's sharp enough that you get good detail. It used to be cheap enough that it was almost one of the cheapest lenses you can buy. However, now I think the 50 mm 1.8 is a lot cheaper. And the reason is that is noisy. Do not even think about that for video. That lens makes a horrendous constant motor noise as it's trying to focus. and if you're using the in-camera audio, which I wouldn't recommend, but you can, all you will hear is that motor moving. It is annoying. Even in very bright conditions, it searches for so long the autofocus on the a7R2. Apparently it's better on newer cameras and there's firmware that tried to fix that, but that isn't the case with this thing. But the FE28 is just silent. It's always doing its thing. It's not gonna be the quickest now necessarily. It's a little bit darker in here deliberately. In the field, in the car, you've got moving background all the time, but it usually sticks to my face fine. Polarizer on it if it's sunny conditions, then I can use F2, depth of field, and it's fine. There are times when it jumps a bit, but if I'm filming alone, I have to use autofocus anyway. I could preset the focus and put something, but if I move around or something for whatever reason, then I'm out of focus for the shot. So I'd rather have a little bit of a delay or have a cameraman to do it than the other alternative. Overall, even though it's around 300 plus now, I think, there's gonna be links to all the products in the description if you wanna have a look. I think it's worth it. It's fantastic. I've used it for pretty much everything. I think this and the F4 24 to 105, the G, not the G Master 2870, that's a beast. I used that for a few months. But no, the F4 one, that's a good combination. Good level of zoom. The F4, okay, it's annoying, but that's a smaller lens, less bulky, and this is very small. You can always put this in a pocket. It actually fits in this beautiful bag. No problem at all. I mean, it's not like the RX1R and the RX1R2 that is that tiny 35 mil sensor full frame. That thing really is pocketable, but this thing is as close as you're gonna get. And for all the features you have, that's, that's quite impressive. The number three isn't one you can see. Well, you can, because I'll show you it. But it's one that you'll hear. So that is this little thing. An audio recorder. Is that a name? Yeah, I think that's the name. Now, this baby is from Zoom. It's the H2N. I picked this one because it's smaller than the others. And when I'm doing a one or two night trip, don't typically want to take one of those horrible giant camera suitcase things or whatever because that's just annoying really really not worth doing so i want all my stuff to fit in the overnight travel bag and this thing does if anything i would have liked to have got one with the xlr connection so i could have used other microphones sometimes i would quite like to use a mini boom type thing so i don't have to put the lapel on i can just go for it peter mckinnon style what's up everybody this thing the sound quality is very good it's compact. It takes batteries. The batteries last ages. The files aren't too big. I've got a 32 gig, slow as anything, memory card in here, and it's absolutely fine. No issues at all. The build quality is very good as well. I've dropped it probably five or six times because the other problem with the lapel is it's very easy to walk somewhere and pull this with you or forget to unplug it. Not good. You can also put it on a table and the mics in here are actually quite good quality. These will pick up a conversation between two people. So you could use it for interviews as opposed to having two separate mics or whatever. And another masterful little trick this thing has is auto gain. So I used to have to set the gain 
but that can be annoying because suddenly if you're on a different patch of road that's much noisier or for some reason I get a little bit quieter, a little bit louder, or the engine gets louder and quieter, which obviously it will do when you put your foot down. So auto gain is incredibly useful. You may hear very occasionally in some of my videos that the audio just drops a little bit. Now I manually try and bring that back up with some gain so you guys don't notice, but some of the audio people among you may catch that. And that's just where the gain has, I don't know, it gets a bit drunk. Ultimately, a shoot is probably 99.9% .9 fine. You just get the odd moment of inconsistency. Fine by me. It's an easy fix. You just plonk this in a little cup holder. Used to be the ashtray, no more. And away you go. Now that is connected to this thing here, which now I've touched is probably going to make horrible noises, sorry. This is the little road lavalier, which I spent, I think about 40 pounds on, and it's good. So it's omnidirectional, which means it can pick up if you're talking to someone else, if they're close enough, and that's quite good. It's not like other mics that have the cardioid, super cardioid, hyper cardioid patterns, depending on how straight they are. So in other words, this does pick up some ambient cabin noise, engine noise, but that actually can be good, because if you want to hear the engine, this will do that. It makes it feel a bit more like you're in the car with me, hopefully. At least that's the aim. It's like being aboard the Starship Enterprise. Otherwise it'd be like I'm in an electric car and there's no noise at all, which is just a little bit weird. I think for the money, this is a very potent combination, that and the Zoom H2N. It gives you good sound, it's portable. I had to change the clip because I didn't like the one before, but that was, I think, two pounds on Amazon. And there's a rubber band holding it because it's a different thing but blah, whatever it works it's just highly mobile i think the lavalier solution is really really useful for that now i know some car youtubers actually plug directly into the camera and that's not a bad thing to do because then you don't have to sync audio however in premiere pro you just hit synchronize it's fine because you'll see the spikes you can even do it manually if you can be bothered but it's so quick to synchronize with that software that there's there's no point because to be fair audio you don't really hear about it as much. It's always a fancy lens or a camera or the software or the LUT LUTs. But sound is 50, 60, 70, 80% of a video. I mean, think about it. You watch a video with slightly bad potato camera visuals. If the person is still entertaining, you'll stick with it. If the angles aren't quite right, but there's something interesting or compelling, then fine, you'll forgive that, you'll, you'll get on with it. But if the sound is distorting or peaking or too quiet or too loud, you're just gonna be gone. Adios. It's just annoying. So, so annoying. So if you are going to do YouTube in any capacity, I would say get a good microphone setup. And the fifth thing that I'm gonna go into today, because actually there are probably some other cool things, but these ones, I, if I left them, I'd feel naked, basically. But they are just useful, and it's a tripod with a slider. You don't really need the slider, to be honest, but the tripod, I would say, is essential. Just to get the sort of cool panning shots, or up to down, whatever, but it keeps the footage shake free, which I think is really cool. I think it looks nice. If you want something to be really professional, that is the way to do it. Of course, you could also do it with a gimbal. So it really depends exactly what kind of style of video you're doing. But for me, in cars, I find the tripod is really good for driving past. I can get someone else to just plunk the tripod down, hit record, I go past a couple of times, they switch sides, works really well. If you can get a cheap slider as well to go on top, which is what I have on now, then you can get those really cool, gentle, sort of detail shots. You can get it sort of side onto the car, that kind of stuff. And that looks really, really cool. If you combine the two, then that is particularly cool. I think you get some really nice shots. The sort of stuff that you would see on Top Gear, but of course their cameras are a lot better, more detail, they have more flexibility. But even at the 1080 level, 4K, you can get some phenomenal footage quality without spending too much money. Particularly with this camera, actually, it is, it is good. However, if you do get a slider, the electric ones are cool. We have to carry a battery. A little bit annoying, probably good for UK shoots. It would be annoying for me for international car launches. So the mechanical route is good. You have to do it yourself, takes a bit of practice, but 
you can kind of learn to get an action that works well. It doesn't have to be perfect, but the one I have is annoying because it has the tracks face upwards and that means dust and dirt and God knows what else gets stuck inside and you will see that movement as the camera goes from left to right and it is annoying. Some of them I had to stabilize quite hard, the Warp Stabilizer Premiere Pro CC. Good tool, too much though and you'll see the footage go a bit horrible and crazy. So you don't want too much motion. But when I was shooting a 90mm uh, Leica f2.8 lens, and our version, they're much cheaper than the M, Pro tip. Super 35, that is getting very zoomy. And so every tiny bit of movement on the car is more pronounced. Warp Stabilize isn't gonna save that very well because actually with this camera and some cameras, you get sort of rolling shutter, not necessarily in this instance, but it will just move around and it, it just looks bad can't really fix it at all so tripod 100 percent useful slider a little bit more expensive but i think if you can get a really cheap budget tripod with a slider that'd be cool or perhaps a video tripod and add a slider later but i would definitely recommend having something that you can position your camera on for stability could even be if you live near a forest or whatever a joby gorilla pod sometimes shooting lower on the ground makes cars look much faster. So that could definitely work too. Anyway, wow, I have talked for an incredibly long time. But hopefully that gives you a little insight into how to film car videos and also why I've picked certain equipment. So if you want to do it yourself and try and achieve reasonably good quality, I hope you guys like what I'm, how my videos look. Of course, I'm always open to feedback. We're all learning. You should never stop learning. That is definitely a life lesson, you remember that. But yeah, hopefully you found this useful. If you have, please subscribe, please hit like, and all that other social stuff, whatever you're into. And I will see you in the next video. Take care, bye.